And now, WWAX Productions proudly presents The Spotlight with Justin Hollywood. Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Season 2, Episode 17 of The Spotlight. I am your host, Justin Hollywood. And today I am here joined with my guest at this time, Chris Maine. Chris, welcome to the show. What's up? What's up, my gosh? Baby, that is not happy right now, but we'll get through this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chris, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up and uh, where did you come from? Um, well, I was born in Augusta, Georgia, to be honest. But uh, I grew up most of my life in Florida, in West Palm Beach. And, uh, yeah, man, I moved a lot, though, so. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Traveling, man. Oh, man, sorry about this. I'm just trying to keep, keep my son from flipping out. I understand, man. So, but, yeah, um. Augusta and West Palm Beach and a little bit of Alabama as well uh, as far as growing up so you didn't grow up with Jacoby Boykins did you <laughs> no I didn't uh, what's funny though is I think around the time that I was in Alabama he was too but we we're in totally different parts of the state which is still funny because we still have the same zip code, so go figure. It's weird how Alabama's zip code thing is set up. So. Oh, wow. Did you watch wrestling as a child growing up? Oh, yeah. Um, my my grandmother uh, actually got me into it. My grandma Hattie, and um, she was a huge Macho Man fan, and when I started watching it and understanding and you know figuring out who i liked i landed on bret hart i guess it was the shades uh, or you know whatever but just something about bret hart captured me and you know i was i still am to this day a bret hart fan uh and still wish i could get some of those shades but uh, that's the kid in me <laughs> interesting besides the hit man who are some of your other favorites as a kid um, growing up, let's see, uh, I would have to say, um, although they were immense rivals at the time growing up, uh, Shawn Michaels was another one, uh, Mr. Perfect, uh, Jake Snake Roberts, um, let's see, who else, a Macho Man, of course, you know, my grandma was a big fan of Macho Man, you know, and then, you know, with WCW, uh, you know, in the early years, uh, you know, of course, you know, the Four Horsemen, you know, Ric Flair and all that, even though at the time growing up, it, I started to understand a little bit of why they, what the lore was about the Four Horsemen. But at first I didn't like them, and then once I figured it out, it was like, I like, I kind of like these guys. And um, let's see, Sting, of course, was, you know, a huge favorite of mine. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Um, Lex Luger. Uh, Great Muda was a huge influence on me as far as from WCW, the old days of WCW. Uh, Muda was captivating. So, like, early years growing up, yeah, definitely those guys. Those guys really, you know, said something to me as far as, you know, being a wrestling fan. Did any of them leave a lasting impression on you and influence who you are today? Um, as far as like the early years and looking at where I'm at now and how I've developed my, my style, uh, perfect was a major influence in the beginning. Uh, as a matter of fact, I kind of tailored part of, you know, my, my upcoming as far as beginning in wrestling around uh, Mr. Perfect, you know, the towel throws and everything like that. And uh, just trying to be the most, you know, athletic and gifted person, you know, coming in. And then uh, Great Mood is still to this day, and even Mr. Perfect for that matter, uh, as far as the early years, 
Um, they still have a big influence on me, but Great Buddha just, I think he was the one that had the biggest impact as far as, you know, growing up and seeing myself now and my style. Uh, Buddha just it resonates around me. Now, as far as um, the biggest influence to my wrestling now or me getting into wrestling, uh, is AJ Styles. AJ Styles, you know, talked to me as far as like seeing TNA for the first time. I was in college actually, and uh, the first time I saw uh, TNA, the first person I saw was AJ Styles, and you know, he was awesome then, awesome now. And uh, he, um, the things he was doing, and you know, at the time, you know, WWE wasn't that great you know it was kind of on this down period so i was trying to find another alternative and i find this and this guy you know in tna and i look him up and he's my size you know he's 510 he's you know 215 pounds and he's from georgia and, you know i'm like you know about 510 about 215 pounds and i was born in georgia you know it's not like he's the biggest guy in the world he's doing amazing things and I could do this. <laughs> so, yeah, he was a major influence on me getting into wrestling and saying, hey, I can do this. Now, don't get me wrong. I would never be. I, I'd love to be on the same part as AJ, but that guy is his name. Phenomenal. And that he is. So what made you decide that professional wrestling is what you wanted to do? Well, of course, like I said, AJ. And, um... I always had, <clears throat> always had this itch to see if I could ever figure out a way. I just never really thought it could be because, you know, growing up, you you know, the big guy syndrome in WWE and, you know, everybody's got to be this big monstrous guy and I'm, you know, small and, you know, nowhere near the size of these giants. And then as, I guess, the evolution of wrestling you know, started to happen where you had smaller guys and everything, you know, that's where it's like, okay, I might have a shot now. And um, so, yeah, seeing AJ and just always wanting to be a wrestler in general, I just, and I finally figured out how. So I was like, yeah, hey, we try this. We see how far I can go with this. All right. So uh, tell me how you got your actual start in the business. Well, I uh, started off, it's funny, because I was in Alabama uh, going to school there, and I was so miserable there, and not because of the school. The school was actually great, but I had some personal de things I had to deal with as far as family goes, and uh, I was like, well, if you know, we move back to Georgia, you know, I want to try to go to Atlanta to WWA4, and I heard all these great things about this place. Never went. And we ended up moving back to the Augusta area. And I was like, I really want to go, but I don't have the money to go right now. And it just so happened, I was going into uh, the mall like every other week and buying, you know, two, three, four DVDs of wrestling. And the guy behind the counter was like, you're a big wrestling fan, huh? And he's, I was like, yeah. He's like, have you ever thought about actually being a wrestler? I was like, yeah, I would love to go to Atlanta and try to train. He's like, well, there's this guy that's training wrestlers, but he runs a Christian organization. Uh, I'll hook you up with him. And they, I think they had a show like the following week after this. And uh, I went up there, and it was uh, Wrestling for Jesus. Oh, wow. And uh, the guy's name is T Money, a.k.a. Timothy Blackman. And, uh, I went to the show and I was just, I saw a ring, I saw people wrestling in it and I was captured. I was like, I gotta do this. And uh, we, we talked, I helped break down the ring, you know, to help, you know, help them out. And didn't even know that was a thing. Like, you know, I was just trying to help out. And, you know, that was like, man, that was one of the things that really stood out about it was the fact that you weren't even a wrestler yet. You already helped to break down the ring. I was like, I was trying to help you guys. So, uh, yeah, and, you know, the next week, it was like, hey, come to the ring, we'll, you know, set you up, we'll train you, and I went, and that was the start of it. So how many years of training did it take you before you had your first match? Let's see, I started, 
I want to say I started when was the okay. Sass of France is like the end of September. That was the festival that they wrestled at. So it's uh, I think it's the end of September. So it's like beginning of October I started, and by the end of November I was having my first match. Wow. So it was really like a month and a half, two months, something like that. So before I was in the ring wrestling. Wow. That's impressive. And it, it, well, it was funny because um, a couple of the guys that was there, you know, we, like, years down the road after I had been in and everything, and we were talking about our first impressions of each other. And uh, they said the first time that I ever got into the ring and uh, started, you know, bumping around and everything, they swore up and down that I had been doing this before. And I was like, no, I'm fresh in. I've never done this before. He's like, no, you're too good. You've done this before. I'm like, no. It just came naturally to me. I think that's just from years and years of wrestling and mimicking or, excuse me, watching wrestling and mimicking it, you know, down in the basement with my, my uncles and, you know, we were watching it, and, you know, super kicking each other and putting each other in sharpshooters and stuff like that. So maybe that played a part, but it just came naturally to me. Okay. If you don't mind me asking, uh, who was your first ever opponent? It was my first ever opponent? Yes. Uh, I had a, it was a fatal four-way match. It was me versus, uh, what was his name at the time? It was J.C. Walker. At the time, he was going by, uh, God, what was his name? Tama or something like that. I can't remember. Um, Kevin Reddy, who was going by Diadem then, I believe. I believe he was in that match. And I want to say, uh, Who's the fourth person? Maybe Nick Phoenix, who is uh, J.C. Walker's brother, Nick Walker. I think we were all in that match, but I can't remember 100%, but I knew it was, I know it was a fatal four-way. And uh, it was in Bar... It was in... What was it? It was in South Carolina. I cannot remember the town. It was start, It starts with a B. But I can't remember the town because J.C. Walker gave me a Pele kick and knocked me out. Literally, like, it was the hardest kick I've ever taken. And, like, I saw stars, and I ended up on the, on the floor. And I remember coming to, and I was like, what's going on? And then the next thing I know, somebody was diving on me. <laughs> Man, that had to be rough. Uh, what's your opinion of darkness? Of darkness? Yes. Um, darkness, personal aside, and, you know, we, you know, for those that know of me and darkness's deal, you know, we had our falling out. And it's most unfortunate, but, you know, life happens. But as far as a professional, I thought he was super talented. And so talented, yet never believed he was as talented as we all saw him. And I think if he was, I'm not sure what he's doing right now. We've lost contact. But uh, I always thought that if anybody out of the group, would have made it, it would have been that guy. And I have the utmost respect for him and what he's done. And I wish that, you know, there was some way, shape or form that he could, you know, come back and do something. Cause I think he would still be awesome. I also know that you and uh, Darkness have a long history together in the business. What was it like working with him and the guys in TWF? <laughs> TWF was special. Um, and for those that don't know, uh, that was Thrown Wrestling Federation, and that came about after the WFJ deal. And uh, have you ever seen the the documentary uh, TWF, the the story of T Money? I can't remember the exact name of it. I, I make a cameo in it, but we we pretty much broke off of that and started our own deal. And seeing guys like me and you know 
Darkness and James Hunter, you know, uh, died in or and uh, just come up with this this deal to just have fun and wrestle. And it was in the middle of nowhere in the backyard, actually in the front yard, and we had fun. And what's amazing about TWF to this day is the fact of we had, we, I mean, we were yard tards in a sense, but we made the most of it, and we made the most of it past TWF. I mean, look at uh, Kenji, Kenji Brea, uh, a.k.a. Ken Lee. Um, he came from there. I actually helped train him. Dustin Knight, uh, another great talent. Um, to say that I trained them at TWF and to see what they did, you know, more more so Ken than Dustin because I know he's been kind of in and out. But, uh, and I know he's back in and I know he's trying to make a comeback and I'm hoping that all that works out. I would love to have him back in, in the CSRA. But, uh, but seeing those guys and seeing what they've done and the success that they had that, you know, at the time, you know, it's, it still means a lot to me. And, you know, we had, you know, we all kind of fell apart, but I still hold that time and those people special in some way, shape, or form. You also work for uh, Flatline in both incarnations of FCW and FPW. What was it like working for them, and how did the two differ? Um, well, starting off with uh, Flatline Championship Wrestling, um, it was more of... How can I put it? It wasn't... That's hard. That's a hard question right there, because it wasn't really that it was. It was different in the sense of the players in in the locker room, but it still held. I mean, it it still was still had its own like aura about it. Uh, Flatline, Flatline. I had some great memories. Uh, Flatline Championship Wrestling doing VIP was one of them. Uh, the Flatline versus TWF storyline there, the sh- that show was amazing. Being able to actually start a riot in Patriots Park was one of the greatest things I've ever seen as far as, you know, people throwing stuff and just absolutely upset, just people flipping chairs and everything. That and just, the whole, like I said, VIP with me, uh, me, Brandon Paradise, um, Chris Williams, a.k.a. Devin Wright, um, Cali Casanova, and Miss Harden. We, that that core group, it was so awesome doing that. And people absolutely hated us, but it was so much fun. So much fun. But, um, and then you go to Flatline Pro, and I started there. And then I, that around the time that you know, I started, I, I think actually they had started back up and I was already out of the game. Like I had taken my two years off. So when I came back, uh, seeing the aspect of, you know, who was in now and how that was going and seeing who was gone. And, you know, it was weird, but at the same time, it still felt the same. And then I had great memories there. Uh, no. And I'm sorry, I was there for the second incarnation from the beginning, and then me and Anthony had our I Quit match, which I would rank as one of my best matches that I've had over my over my time in wrestling. And uh, doing that, you know, seeing you know my buddy Jacoby, you know, become champion, and you know, watching that happen on, from the sidelines, you know, that was that was great. And then coming back again at the end and you know doing my little program with him after everything that went down and then it closed and it was it was, a, it was a bittersweet end but i'm grateful for the the opportunity that flatline provided both flatline championship wrestling and flatline pro you mentioned your uh i quit match with anthony henry as being one of your most best known matches in flatline pro but you know it, this match was also special to you because it was also your send-off 
as uh, Daniel Maine said, you headed to the armed forces. How did that work out for you? <laughs> so I was actually all set, ready to go, had passed my ASVAB and everything. I I got into where, uh, for one, at the end, like I was before that match, I was kind of burnt out and I had a lot of things going on personally. And um, I was going to go into the military to, you know, provide for my family. I just had my daughter, I was with, you know, my fiance at, in, uh, I was like, I'm gonna, you know, let this thing go. I gotta let wrestling go to, to provide for my family. So I made the decision, I had taken the ASVAB, had passed, you know, all I had to do was just go and do the uh, MEPS, which is where you go and take your physical and everything, yada, 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 take the test over again, you know, to, you know, see where you rank, all that stuff. And forgive me if I have the, have the um, order wrong or right or wrong or whatnot, but, uh, but yeah, so I went to Jackson at our camp, or Fort Jackson in Columbia, took my ASVAB again, did my physical and everything, and uh, it didn't work out because they lost my paperwork, my medical paperwork. Wow. And, like, I had failed, I, like, I went there, I would failed for uh, my blood pressure test. So it was like, you know, go to your doctor, get them to uh, do your test again, send it back in, and if it clears, then you can go. I did exactly that, send in my medical paperwork. My recruiter called me and said, uh, so they lost your paperwork, so we need you to go back to Fort Jackson and do MEPS all over again, but you won't be able to do it because the next time you can go is such and such date. It's like, okay, that's cool, I guess. Not really, because I was really looking forward to trying to do this military thing. And right as that happened, I got a call from T-Mobile, and they said, hey, we want to hire you, and we're going to start you off at X amount of dollars. I was like, you know what? I'm going to stay home. I'm not going to try to go through MAPS again. I'm just going to do this. That way I can stay home. I can be with my family. Bump it. I'm just going to leave it alone. So, and that's how... That story went. Hey, sorry that happened to you, man, but at least you got a job in return, right? Yeah, it, it was weird because it was like, I never, and I even talked to some of the guys that, you know, or some of my family members or some of my friends that have been, you know, through MEPS and everything, and they said that's, that's pretty common for them to do something like that. I'm like, really? It, like, this is the U.S. military. That's not a good thing, but... I mean, then again, you have so many people, you know, signing up every day, and you know, I, I guess I can understand it, but I get. And then again, maybe it was just a blessing, or you know, whatever, because I guess it wasn't meant to go. So. Did you ever miss wrestling while you were away? At first, no. I was so content with being away from wrestling. I was happy. I had, you know. I had my, you know, daughter, I was, you know, with my fiance, we were happy, you know, getting life together, you know, being, you know, a family. It wasn't until about a year in, and I blame, I fully blame Jacoby Boykins, Ken Lee, my fiance, my family, and Shane Hexen, that guy. <laughs> I blame all of them for pretty much cornering me and saying, hey, you need to go back to wrestling. You're not going to the military now. We've been waiting for you to do that. That fell through, and you've already got your job and everything. Bump it. You're coming back to wrestling. I was like, I'm not doing that. I'm happy. I'm trying to take care of them. You. You can be happy taking care of your family and wrestling. You can do this. We need you back. You're too good of a talent, blah, 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 blah. Finally, I was like, yeah, I'll do it. All right, fine. I'm coming back to wrestling. I didn't right away. <laughs> I ended up waiting another year before finally coming back. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> when you finally returned to Flatline during its final days, it seemed that you uh, 
you return bigger and better than you ever were in your original run and you are also in the run for the Pulse Championship and feuding with Jacoby, Daniel and Rashad, you know, the powerhouse. What was that like for you? Now, it was kind of cutting in and out again, so I apologize. It might be my headset, I'm not sure, but uh, if I heard you right, uh, coming back to Flatline, uh, being pretty much put into the middle of the whole uh, deal with Jacoby and Hex, and having to fight the, having to fight pretty much Rashad and, you know, them, right? Correct? Yeah. Uh, coming back into Flatline, you know, the landscape had changed yet again. And, um, again, I was there when I saw Jacoby win the title. And then I saw how everything was playing out and then seeing my two best friends at the time um, facing each other for a title and then, you know, Jacoby kind of, you know, played us and, you know, did that thing there as far as, you know, shorthanding Hex and getting people to, you know, jump on them. So coming back in and being thrusted right into the middle of that, it was, it was, it was weird. <laughs> But at the same time, it was fun because, you know, it was more or less just uh, having to play, you know, the mediator between two of my best friends and at the same time fight off everybody else that's trying to mess up this thing that's supposed to be special between, you know, two friends that ended up being actual enemies and really hating each other, so... Yeah, you know, it sucked how that went down, but you know, at the same time, though, I was just happy to be back. Were you uh, disappointed when you found out Flatline was closing its doors not too long after you returned? Yes, I was. Um, Flatline again was was a very special time in my I hate to say the word career, but I guess in my time in wrestling, you know, Flatline both incarnations of Flatline was special. And uh, to hear that they was going to shut it down and, you know, that this was pretty much the end, it... I, I, I still, I miss being able to go to, to Flatline because Patriots Park had so many memories and just being able to see my friends and, you know, things like that. So, Flatline closing was was a again a bittersweet situation because it went out with a bang and I was happy about that but at the same time though I didn't want flatline to close yeah I think a lot of people were uh, very upset when flatline ended but you know some other promotions were on the rise at the time and we'll get into some of those a little bit later but uh, what are some other promotions that you've enjoyed working for throughout your time in, in the business? Um, well, all of them, for the most part, I enjoyed at one time or another because I was able to, to show what I could do in the ring and be able to display how I could contribute to my craft, which is professional wrestling. Um, so but Flatline, uh, TWF, those are special. Um, even now, like uh, AWE, Atlanta Wrestling Entertainment, um, has a very special place because they were the first uh, organization to actually take a shot on me when I came back in. Uh, I, that was my first match back, honestly, was AWE. And to be able to you know, saying that I'm still a part of that organization and, you know, doing some great things there and, you know, being able to say, hey, they took a shot on me and I think I'm doing a good job by them. You know, that's, you know, that's amazing to me. Um, I think, uh, let's see, what else? And there's so many, from, I can't really say that there's one promotion like those, like the ones near and dear to me are always going to be at the top of the list, but at the same time, though, I mean, 
just being able to perform in front of you know people in Georgia, Florida, you know South Carolina, North Carolina, you know being able to go up to Chicago, you know things like that, you know it, it, every opportunity to be in the ring in front of a crowd to you know showcase my my skills, in, you know in a craft that I that I love is always just a great moment for me. Tune in next week for part two of our exclusive interview with Chris Mayne, only on the Spotlight. This has been a WWAX production.